Who's the biggest sports figure to come out of the Tri-Cities? Some might say my guest right now, Keith Jennings. Head basketball. I mean, it's a big f field, and to tell you the truth, maybe a Jason Witten beats you out. Maybe a Steve Spurrier does, somebody like that. But uh, the only TSU player to play in the NBA, uh, to really regular season guy, I know Greg Dennis had uh, uh, a cup of coffee with the uh, Atlanta Hawks, and uh, Skeeter Swift played in the ABA. He was an original San Antonio Spur. But uh, nevertheless, the only player to come from ETSU to play uh, in the NBA, as well as when he left ETSU, number two assist man all time in the history of college basketball. Uh, that's Mr. Jennings. And uh, the Basketball Chronicles of Mr. Jennings, you want to check this book out online, be it Barnes & Noble, be it Amazon, be it someplace like that. But uh, he also is now making it into a documentary. And I guess the first question I should ask is, you mentioned you're talking to Les Robinson. Tell me this. Uh, is this going to be distributed to theaters? Is this going to be uh, something that we buy as a DVD? How are we going to be able to watch the documentary of the Basketball Chronicles of Mr. Jennings? Well, the, uh, well, the, the movie is Forever, Forever Buck Brothers. That's, that's documentary the movie my personal documentary that's something that will probably be done in the near future also but the, uh, the, the movie forever that was you know you were we, we are definitely our marketing person kelly uh kelly cole he's our marketing person and he's going to try to get us in some theaters for uh, you know as, as far as letting some of the fans come and see it and Put it out there like that, but yes, we are going to put it on a DVD also, and we're probably we're still thinking about what's going to be the best way to get that out to the people too. So we start, we're kind of like in the final stages. I'm about to meet with uh, him and Sterling and Kelly really soon to try to get everything, uh, our final plan in order to try to get everybody ready for it. Because I've, I've had a lot of people ask about it. A lot of people are like anticipating it, like. Like it's one of the top movies that's coming out, and that's a that's a fun thing to be a part of. So it's uh doing this is kind of suspenseful at the same time, but you know I, I, we want this to be really something that everyone remembers, and you know, there's, there's no shortcuts to greatness. I tell my mm -hmm. friends seeing that all the time. There's no shortcuts to greatness, so you got to go through the process. And like I said, you know this is my first experience doing something like this, even though I. I've played on TV numerous times. I've, I've been in commercials. I've been in sitcoms a little bit. But this is this is going to be something, you know, I'm also excited to see and be a part of. Now, wait a minute. You've been in sitcoms. I'm, I'm the guy who knows that uh, Byron Cherry, who was one of the replacement Duke boys on the Dukes of Hazard, actually played football at ETSU. I may be the only guy who knows that, but other than Byron Cherry himself. But uh, so there have been some TV. Uh, net, but, but what sitcom were you on? I, that I wasn't aware of. Sure. They had this show called Hanging with Mr. Cooper. I remember that one, yeah. And they had an episode where he was trying to make the Warriors. So, yeah, I was, uh, I had a little light cameo in that. You know, I didn't have a speaking part, but I was, you could see me playing and been good as day in the uh, background, talking about Tim Hardaway. <laughs> so, uh, but it was, it was a fun process. So, seeing how all that stuff worked and, you know, watching it all develop, it, it makes this, you know, kind of easy to deal with. With uh, you mentioned Tim Hardaway, I mean uh, it looks like Penny's going to be the coach at Memphis and make the leap from high school to uh, major college. Uh, do you have any opinions about that? I thought, uh, boy, it's a real tough business if you're getting rid of a legendary coach like Tubby Smith after a 21 victory season for a high school coach. But uh, when was the last time you talked to Penny? What are you, what are your thoughts on this potential move over at Memphis?
it's always, you know, it's just an opportunity. You know, I think it's just what you make of it. I think I think Penny, you know, former players definitely have somewhat of an advantage because you know the situation. It's not something that we've read about or that we watch. You've been in those situations, you know. So I, I'm sure Penny's going to bring that. And, you know, in college, you know, I, even on my level of division too, you know, having an NBA behind your name, that's, that's something kids want to learn from. Sure. Man, that's a, that's a bonus. You know, I think when, when you go out recruiting and your coaches are telling, you know, the potential recruit that, yeah, my, my coach played in the NBA and he's this and he's that. I mean, a lot of kids gravitate to that really quick because that's a lot of dreams for a lot of kids these days. I mean, as it was for me back in the day. I know that, yeah, a lot of times it's said that, uh, you know, the great athlete does not become a great coach, you know, um, or great manager if we're talking about baseball. Uh, now, you know, where I'm going with this, though, is a lot of people these days, mister, say, you know what, today's athlete really does want someone who's done it before. And in your case, I mean, playing in the NBA, I've got to think that there aren't a whole lot of D2 coaches uh, coaching women's basketball uh, that have played in the NBA that you're going up against. Uh, you mentioned this, but what kind of a recruiting advantage is this for you? I mean, I, I assume you may be getting some parents who say, I remember you, yeah, with the Warriors, or yeah, I remember you and uh, playing for ETSU. Uh, how often does that happen? coaching the women this year, you know, these girls, they kind of knew me because I coached on the men's side last year, so mm -hmm. I supported them a lot. But um, I don't think they really realize the things I accomplished in the game. So this year, when we go to every gym, especially on the road, it's like somebody at every gym knew me. And it took about, after the first month, that one of my players was like, hey, coach, you know somebody everywhere. Or somebody knows you everywhere. <laughs> And I, you know, not bragging about it, I was like, yeah, I, I did a lot in this game, you know. Mm -hmm. So I, I think they're starting to get it a little bit more now. But, you know, it, it, it definitely helps me in recruiting. When, I, when I'm calling a potential recruit and I ask them if they checked out our website yet, and if they say yes, then most likely they've read up on my bio. But if they say no, and I tell them, you know, well, I played in, in, in East Tennessee State and I also played in the NBA, it's a conversation change, you know, it's, I've seen girls go from kind of being a little quiet to all of a sudden now I got their full attention. So that's, you know, that's one of the advantages of having an NBA behind you. Well, one of the things I know that I am a big uh, proponent of, you don't go straight from high school to coaching a D1 head coach uh, that you, you know, and this is how we started this uh, line of questioning in our interview, Keith, but, you know, like Penny Hardaway may be trying to do, However, if you do have that NBA background that does change it a little bit, I have mentioned that a lot has changed in 45 years, but yeah, John Thompson made that move uh, to go to Georgetown in 1972, and it worked out pretty well. Of course, he had the background with the Celtics, so it worked out a little bit better for him than, say, Bob Wade going from Dunbar to Maryland, you know, something of that nature. Right. And that's why I have always been, you know, looking at the Bob Wade, and there are a lot of other guys saying, you know what? high school directly, without that assistant apprenticeship for however long, you know, Bobby Knight was a high school coach. He became an assistant coach at Army, got the head coaching job there. You know, the rest is history. So, you know, I mean, there's a, a natural order to make things. a valid point, but at the same time, you know, I can also see that Chris Mullen, who's at St. John's, yes. who I don't think coached any high school or any college, and all of a sudden, he has St. John's relevance, so to speak, again. I mean, they might not be in the tournament, but I'm sure he's getting recruits that those past coaches couldn't get. And it's going to, you're going to see the same thing at Georgetown with Patrick Ewan. You know, I don't remember him coaching too much in college or in high school, but the fact that he was probably one of Georgetown's best, sure, he's going to get some All-Americans in at Georgetown, all because of the strength of of what he did, not only there, but staying in the NBA. Yeah, and he was a long-time NBA assistant. Wanna, yeah. He do good just because of the fact they knew what they were doing when they played there. He was, he, like said, yeah. You don't really hear about the great players that do a great job, coaches. You only hear about the ones that were so-called great that don't end up doing a good job. You hear more about those guys than the other guys that are great. I guess they're supposed to be great coaches if they were great players. You don't hear that. 
Sure. Now, and, and Ewing, as I just I mentioned, he did coach uh, in the NBA as an assistant for many years. Uh, Mullen, I think Mullen, last I looked, was 15 and 16 there at uh, Seton Hall. But like you said, I mean, well, you know, they took care of their legends at, uh, not at Seton Hall, listen to me, at uh, St. John's. Yeah. They took uh, care of their, le I remember the final four, trust me, okay, I remember exactly. him at St. John. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, all right. I know you do. I yeah, know. anyway, they, I, 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 I'm correcting myself here, but no, what I, what I wanted to though say, and, and I'll, I'll segue to this, uh, I know that a lot of people uh, have said, you know, boy, it would be great to have Mr. back at ETSU. We talk about this a lot. Obviously, you're doing uh, well as the women's basketball coach there at Lee's McRae, but there was an opening on the staff that went to a fine coach, B.J. Mackey, uh, at ETSU. When there was an opening, did, was there any contact with you over there at Lee's McRae about potentially joining Steve Forbes' staff? You know, I, I had, once I had heard about it, I had reached out to Coach Forbes uh, real quick. But, you know, I'm sure every coach already has a ton of guys that they would like to work with sure. or, you know, things of that nature. And, you know, I didn't really know him personally until he came here. So I'm sure his coaching tree was deep where he had some people that he might have already preferred no matter if I played there or not. You know, I think when it comes to that, as a coach, you got to go with who you're comfortable with. And, you know, if he's not comfortable with me, I, I wouldn't expect him to have me on his staff, you know. And like I said, I, I think we get along great, though. When mm -hmm. I get a chance to see Coach Ford, I think he's done a wonderful job with East Tennessee. Uh, every time I've talked with him, it's been nothing but respect shown on both sides. But uh, like I said, when it comes to coaching, it's about getting, who, uh, getting on your staff who you feel comfortable with and, you know, it's just a must-win in that direction. And, like you said, he's doing a great job. I, I cannot complain about what's happening yeah. in Tennessee. They're doing, they're doing a wonderful job with the program. I mean, B.J. Mackey is a good hire. Don't get us wrong here, you know, and all this. And I spoke to him before the season and all the. I remember him playing at South Carolina. And, in fact, in, uh, in an, another segment, I've got a real big scoop at B.J. Mackey uh, is going to be a part of that I'm going to tell people about here uh, coming up. But let's go back to your uh to your documentary here forever brothers uh who all is in the documentary you mentioned les robinson but uh tell me if you will are there any surprise figures big name that we wouldn't expect in an etsu documentary that is going to be a part of your documentary well i think everybody that you would expect you know the, the main reason that came together with the uh with that title Forever, because you know Marty and Calvin and Greg are the, uh, are the only basketball players that I played with that have won four state tournament titles, and I mm -hmm. thought that was something special enough to be talked about. So that that was how I came up with it. Just really trying to show that you know we, we got tradition at East Tennessee State, and I played with guys that won four state tournament titles, and I don't know how many other players can say that they've done that at their university. But I know I can, I, I played with it. So it kind of started with that. So really, Marty, Calvin, and, and uh, Greg are the main phase of the, of, the, of the video. It's about them winning four rings. But then the rest of it, you'll have myself, you'll have uh, Mike Woods, you have Chad Keller, of course, Major and Alvin. You know, uh, we kind of got quite a few of the brothers, fuck brothers in there that really was at it from ground zero, you know, that saw how it, transformed from winning seven games to five years later winning 28 games and being nationally ranked. So, I mean, it, those guys all had a major part in it, along with myself. And, you know, I just felt like it was a good time to share our story. Mm -hmm. I don't think a lot of people, besides people in our area, really knew how, how good we were. And so I, I thought when, they, when I'm watching NCAA basketball and I see how they're talking about these programs, and I'm thinking, he's done a lot of that, you know, I mean, I wonder where we rank in the mid-majors, so to speak. Sure. I think this will probably put us in the mix for the rest of the mid-major talk. Let me let me ask. I know your senior year, uh, ETSU had achieved as high as the number ten ranking. They finished number seventeen. However, you only received a ten seed in the tournament. I recall and lost. I think it was sixty six sixty three 
to Iowa. And I mean, if you, if you do the rankings, I mean, we see it this year. Uh, St. Mary's is ranked number 20, 25th in this poll. They don't make the NCAAs and, uh, you know, and all this back then. Was there a feeling of disappointment that, hey, we're a nationally ranked team. What you doing seating us 10th? Man, that was, I mean, like I said, they, they always talk about the NCAA and they always say how things are going with the NCAA. I mean, yeah, it's a lot of stuff that goes on that that often wonder who comes up with these, you know, with the scenarios that they present. I mean, each of the previous two years, you know, our, our ranking wasn't as good, but we got, we at least was regionally, you know, at home, close to home. Mm-hmm. Send us all the way out to Minneapolis. Like, we didn't just win 27 games, and even though we lost our big man and Calvin was hurt, I still thought that we, you know, I was, our season should have been, still should have been a higher seed than the 10th seed. I and mean, that's something that, that'll always be disappointing to me because, like I said, we, we, we never was healthy going into the tournament besides our sophomore years when we almost got Oklahoma. Every year after that, somebody key was kind of hurt. So we needed all, all the type of advantages that year and to be shipped out to Minnesota and then play a tough Iowa team. It was, it was a disappointing, disappointing way to end our career. I can, yeah, I I understand it. But, of course, there was, uh, after you had left and gone to the Warriors, the uh, Buccaneers did go back to the NCAA tournament the following year, and that was the year that they defeated Arizona. I do want to ask you, uh, the game you're probably most remembered for during that era, you know, it's 72-71, the one-point loss, a uh, uh, one-time 15-point lead that is lost to number one-ranked Oklahoma. But it always bothered me. I mean, that game was referenced to in the Southern Conference final broadcast. But yeah, I got to, I, I, I got to tell you though, you know. <laughs> Yeah, and an objective source as well. I mean, although I do think well, one of the things that I've always been the critical thing that I look at that game is that you have four seconds left, you can't get the ball past half court for the final shot. That that always uh, bugged me, even though you had fouled out. I thought that you know, hey, at least have a chance here. You know, get it past half court. Still though, it's a loss, and I've always had a problem that probably the game that ETSU is most remembered by Keith Jennings is a loss. Is that the game you remember more, or is there a victory, say, against NC State, say, against Marshall to go to the uh, tournament for the first time that is more vivid in your mind? What's your What's your uh, biggest game from your ETSU career? I mean, you know, us as athletes, I think, especially the ones that have been successful, like, you know, I was blessed to play with some great guys and to win a lot of games. So you would think that one of the championships that I won might would you know, one of those games might be the best game that I can think of. But you're right. I mean, I think the the game, the loss, the loss to Oklahoma was probably the game that jumped in my brain the first when I had to think about memories of playing at East Tennessee State. You know, it was a, uh, it was a time where, like you say, every time the NCAA tournament comes on for the last, since we've left, since that day, whenever they talk about a 1-16, they mention us. You know what I'm saying? It's always a good chance that they might miss in that game. And so to keep hearing it year after year, hearing about it, yeah, that game probably sticks out more so than, you know, the one that, that I really like was winning my first tournament title as a sophomore beating Marshall. I think that game right there was something that triggered something in me to make sure I want to get back to this opportunity to play in the NCAA tournament every year. So th- those two games jump out, but I would say that Oklahoma game, I'm waiting on Thursday already. You know, if yeah. the 16 is close, you're going to hear. I know I might hear my name in our, our university. Do you root for a 16 seed to beat a number one? Uh, I mean, is is that, or is it more like sort of the Miami Dolphins who break out the champagne when uh, there isn't a undefeated team? What uh, What is your feeling of 16 versus one when you watch the game? I mean, I've got to believe it's some at some point, it's going to happen. I mean, we see upsets all the time. <laughs> so I got to believe it's going to happen, but I've never picked it. When I when I, you 
you know, just mess around and pick the brackets of the tournament. I've never picked a 16 seeding a one. But I got to believe at some point we will see that happen. I'll tell you the truth. I mean, uh, I want to see it happen for the very uh, reason that I said, just so that the biggest game in ETSU history, uh, if if a 16 ever beats a 1, probably at that point, the biggest game in ETSU history won't be a loss. It will be something okay. like, you know, as you said, the victory against Marshall, I thought the victory against NC State was uh, just as big of a sporting event, probably the biggest sporting event ever to happen in Johnson City, in my opinion. Or, you know, a historic victory from the old days, the Skeeter Swift days against Florida State or Duke, or, you know, something like that. That's the, you know, a victory, because I've always had a problem with the most famous game being a loss for obvious oh, reasons. Oh. And uh, I'm sure I'm sure now that you are coaching uh, at the Bobcats, that you yourself uh, do not want to be remembered for your losses. Uh, by the now, as I go back, I want to say you were ten and seventeen your first year. Uh, you had Bria Forbes was your uh, leading scorer. And you still have a young team with a lot of uh, a Tri-Cities presence. There's players on your team from Cloudland, from uh, Sullivan Central, from Happy Valley, uh, all over. And uh, even Madison High School over in Mars Hill for uh, some of the listeners that we may have over there. Uh, so, you know, it appears to be, I, I don't think you had any seniors. Well, excuse me, you had one senior on your team this past year. Uh, tell me, as you look forward, what... What are you looking for for your team uh, next season? What are your uh, goals that you have? I mean, well, I was I was very pleased with the effort the girls gave me this year. You know, like I said, considering that the year before they only we only, they only won four games, so I already knew by coaching on the men's side, I was watching them a little bit, and I could see their mentality. And I was already thinking if I ever got the opportunity to coach them, I could help them get better just of my know how and what I know about the game. So, you know, for us to win 10, 10 games this year, I was very pleased with it, but I'm also honest with myself. I was a basketball player. I know 10 and 17 is really not the type of record yeah. I'm proud of. But, you know, sometimes you got to take pride in the small victory. So uh, I think this year, coming back, I think these girls now understand what type of coach they're playing for, uh, someone that's very demanding of their time. You know, I expect them to be dedicated to the program. And, um, you know, one of, the, one of my needs is, Getting more athletic, you know, I, I could tell by some of the teams that we played when they had athletic players, uh, it kind of gave us a problem. And like I said, we were kind of young this year. I had mostly juniors, and then the rest were freshmen and sophomores, and, and they were, you know, not, not a lot of college playing experience. So a lot of them got to grow up this year, and I think this year's recruiting class that I bring in is going to definitely help us. And I, I, don't, I don't think they're going to pick us 10th next year. You know, they picked us 10th and we finished 6th. I'd be surprised if they pick us 10th again next year. But it's, it's what you never know. Like you say, you never know unless you're part of those committees. You mm -hmm. never know what those committees are thinking. <laughs> when you do return Forbes from uh, to your team, uh, and now she's from the Bahamas. Uh, that seems to be an interesting, you know, from the Bahamas to Banner Elk. I can understand the Tri Cities or you know North Carolina to Banner Elk, but yeah, that, that's uh, how'd you get a player from the Bahamas? But actually, she was already here. Right? Sure. So Coach Williams, she had already had her team in place. So I, I didn't recruit any of the girls. So I just kind of had to, you know, work with what we had. And um, I think they had a connection. They had played a, a couple of tournaments over in the Bahamas, and they started seeing some players. And uh, Bria caught their eye. And uh, next thing you know, her dream was coming true of trying to play college basketball. And she had a really – she had an okay year this year. You know, I know she wanted to have a better year. She's one of my toughest girls. She rebounds really hard and plays defense really hard. And her offense struggled just a little bit this year because she had a really good year last year. And anytime you have that type of year, teams prepare for you more. And as a player, if you're not ready for that, then you're going to struggle a little bit. And I think that's one of the things I helped her with as we went along the season. And I think her senior year was would be a, a special season for us. 
And I, you really utilized your roster. I think only one player, is, uh, Marquea Stacy, averaged more than uh, 30 minutes a game. So, uh, yeah, there was a, a, a very – you used all of your roster, I think, to try to build the uh, uh, program there. Hey, how difficult, though, is it being in the shadow of Appalachian State? You know, you're right there. They're D1, big – you know, Sun Belt. Uh, you're D2. Is, is that uh, difficult at all to get attention? I mean, you know, just being on the women's side, you know, you can start you start to see it a little bit different. You know, I think it's always going to be women's basketball is kind of always going to be in the shadows a little bit, and it's unfortunate. But, you know, it's, they're still working hard. You know, I don't think – I didn't know what to expect going into coaching this year. Uh, all I know is, you know, I was going to try to get them to work hard for me. That's what we. That's what they did, and we ended up getting through the year pretty good. So you know, I, I think being next to Bone, I mean, I, I was, I just actually just called them to see if they want to play an exhibition game next year, and uh, I think they might have already had their schedule filled up. So you know, in a situation like where I'm at, you just want to take advantage of all the opportunities. Sure. Sure. Uh, our athletic director works hard for us, and you know, anytime you get a program that's coming from the bottom, it's always difficult trying to make your way to the top, but I've been a part of a program that started kind of low and worked their way up. I understand it's a process, and getting the girls to believe in that and see it from my vision is the challenge, but I think they're starting to do that. Okay, now when do you expect, when's the target days for release of Forever Brothers? You know, I would think now sometime next month, okay. uh, after, after he meets with Coach Robinson, and, and the good thing about a lot of these interviews you know, he's keeping us all in the dark about it a little bit. So I don't really have a I don't really have a lot of what Coach Laporte has said about me or about the team or how the coaches thought before. I can imagine some of the things my Buck brothers have said. So <laughs> it's gonna be a nice it's gonna be a nice twist of seeing things for the first time. I mean, I'm sure I'm gonna get to see it before we release it because I'm gonna approve it or I'm gonna you know not approve it, but I'm sure I'm gonna approve it. But I can't, I'm looking forward to seeing the finished work, and then once we can get it out to everybody, hopefully it'll be sometime in April, and, you know, we can start to finally get some reviews and see what other people think about it. And who knows, you know, it might turn into a 30-30 uh, from ESPN, because I really believe this is one of those stories that, you know, it'll, it'll catch your attention, so to speak. I, I like the optimism, the 30 for 30 of that. And for that matter, you know, that might be something, uh, of, a, of a, uh, top. If they would uh, sign off on it, who knows? But yeah, uh, the, uh, four straight titles of ETSU basketball. They had only won one title in their history in D1 before Mr. got there. And then they won four in a row. All right, so the documentary is Forever Brothers. Look for that in April. Buy and read the Basketball Chronicles of Mr. Jennings. Yeah, don't just wait for the movie. Read the book right there. He's Keith Jennings. He's a legend. And he's on 1420 NBC Sports Radio Tri-Cities. Provides